parent, a grandparent, uh, what are some of the milestones that uh, you look back at having your kids when they're small? Uh, you look back, these are certain milestones that, uh, that your kids went through and experienced that really made you proud. What were some of those things? First word, Thelma said, is first word. Learning to ride a bike. First day, oh yeah, how many cried when your kids went, your oldest one went the first day of school. Potty training, absolutely. That was a big one in our family. Yeah. Learning their first Bible verse. Learning their first Bible verse. Yeah, that's a powerful moment, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know how to talk to you. Yeah, I was thinking of that one. You know, as, as a parent of three, you know, I, I understand and I can connect to these moments that, that we've experienced. Um, you have a sense of accomplishment. You have a certain sense of, 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 of pride when... When your kids learn how to dress themselves and how to feed themselves, those, those first words, that, that, when they can ride the bike all by themselves, uh, going to the bathroom by themselves, that's a huge thing, right? And we really appreciate that one. Uh, Faith is still going through some of the, my youngest now, she's still going through some of those things. She hasn't been able to accomplish everything on her own. My older two, they've kind of passed through a lot of those phases. Uh, we're looking forward. Now, Faith can dress herself, feed herself, she can do all those kind of things, but uh, we're looking forward to that day when she's able to tie her own shoes. And I'm kind of looking forward to that, that phrase that we all like to hear when she looks up at me and says, Dad, I did it, what, all by myself. Don't we like to hear that? We love it when we hear our kids say, Daddy or Mommy, I did it all by myself. We appreciate those moments. We like to hear those words because as parents, we know we have the responsibility to teach our children how to be responsible. I used to tell Elijah, you know, he was the one we had the most trouble with with the potty training, and that's probably just because he's a boy. But I can remember when we were going through that phase, I remember telling him, look, bud, I'm not coming to college to change your diaper. So we're going to have to figure something out here uh, to get you to understand how to go to the bathroom on your own. And that's because we want to train our children to be self-reliant, don't we? We want our kids to be able to dress themselves and feed themselves and and go to the potty on their own, brush their own teeth. We, we want them to eventually know how to pay bills. Some of you who are uh, raising teenagers right now, you're training your children to be able to be on their own, to, to break from, from you, and, and to be able to make their own bed when they leave home, and, and do their own, own laundry perhaps, or pay their bills, or at least marry a wife who can, who can do all those things that mom isn't going to do for you anymore. <laughs> Is it possible for us, and I just want you to think through this, because uh, is it possible that as parents, as we're teaching our kids to be self-reliant, that sometimes, without even thinking about it, we wind up teaching them to not need God? Because that's not what we want to accomplish, is it? We want our children to be self-reliant. We want them to grow up to be responsible citizens and to be able to do things on their own without our help all the time. But we don't want in that process to even subconsciously communicate to them that they have to do everything by myself. It's not cute when an adult says to God, God, I did it all by myself. That's not what we're trying to accomplish as parents, is it? No. That's not who we want to be as adults. And so there is this tension that exists for us. This tension that we know that we have to be responsible adults. We know that we have to have some sense of self-reliance. But this tension exists because we also have a deep need to rely on the Holy Spirit's power every day. Is it possible for us to, to get through this life on our own? Is it possible for us to live day by day... Depending on our own skills, our education, perhaps our, our looks or personality, or perhaps our money, or perhaps our ability to be able to plan and organize the world around us, is it possible for us to navigate through life without the power of the Holy Spirit? Is it possible for us as a church to be able to put together a gather a group of musicians together 
find a, a competent speaker and gather a crowd? Is it possible for a church to grow in size without the power of the Holy Spirit? Before you answer that question, before we say, no, nah, you know, none of us, you know, it's not even possible for us to say, look, God. I'm doing life all by myself. Or it's not impossible for us to, to say, look, God, we're doing church all by ourselves. Before we answer with the, the answer that we think we should say, let's, let's step back and, and entertain the possibility that maybe there's something else happening that we don't even realize. It's possible that uh, we have, without even consciously thinking about it, we have equated... A large gathering on a Sunday morning as absolute evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work. That's not necessarily true. It's possible that we have equated, well, we've, we've kind of managed this far in our lives, and, and we've kind of worked our way through some tough stuff, but if we look back over all of it, it's possible that maybe the only time we ever go to the Holy Spirit is during times of crisis. It may be possible that, that the only time we ever really give up control to the Spirit is during those moments when we've already tried it ourselves, we fall on our face and we say, No, Lord, lead me, help me. I can't do this on my own. I don't want to do this all by myself. See, as a pastor, I can stand here and, and share the gospel week after week. I can challenge you with God's Word week after week. And I'll put my heart into it, and I'll do my best with it. But the reality is this. Only the Holy Spirit can convict a heart. Only the Holy Spirit can rescue a soul and change your life. I can't do that. It doesn't matter how much preparation I put in. It doesn't matter how many nice, funny stories I put in. Only the Holy Spirit can do something spiritual in your heart. I can't. So if you think about it, all the true measures of growth that we want to see, all the true measures of growth that really matter, we desperately need the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings. Chapter 18. 1 Kings, chapter 18. As you're turning there, I'd like to give you some background information of what's happening in this passage. At this particular time in history, Israel had a king named Ahab. And Ahab was an evil man. Ahab had married a pagan woman named Jezebel. And she was just as evil, and they worshipped a false god named Baal together. In fact, Ahab, King Ahab, had left the altar of the Lord go by the wayside, and he had built a temple and an altar to Baal for he to worship and, and for the people that he was leading, the people of God, to worship this false god named Baal. And God had had enough of it, and so he sends, God sends Elijah, the prophet Elijah, with a message for Ahab. And the message is this. King Ahab, there is a severe famine coming your way, and it will not end until I say it ends. And then Elijah left. And God told Elijah, now I want you to go hide on the other side of the Jordan River. And if you read through the story maybe this week, you'll see how God provided water and food for Elijah over the next several years in miraculous ways. It really is a fascinating story. The famine came. It was bad. Three and a half years, it didn't rain. And as things are dying, as it's getting more and more difficult to, to feed people, and it's getting more and more difficult to find water, King Ahab gets angry. And he's angry at Elijah. He doesn't take responsibility for uh, this drought. He's angry with Elijah. He hates Elijah, and he has sent people to go and find him so that he can kill him. And while that's all happening, 
over this three and a half year period, eventually God says to Elijah, it's time. And that's, this is where we pick up in chapter 18. It says, after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Look what he says in verse 1. I want you to go present yourself to Ahab. And I will send rain on the land. So the time for this, this famine, uh, this drought to end has come. And, and he says to Elijah, I want you to go back and I want you to stand face to face with the man who's trying to kill him. And if you look in verse 2, what does Elijah do? Does he make excuses? Does he rationalize whether or not he should? What's he do? Wet. He wet. So here Elijah, uh, he goes and, and he's on his way back and, and there's this prophet Obadiah that has uh, been out also searching, helping for Elijah. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But eventually, Elijah comes face to face. He finds King Ahab and they, and they meet. Now for me, I'm just imagining this. This was probably an awkward moment. You know, who, you're standing in front of the man who's been searching for you to kill you, and there you stand. Here, and here he is looking at you with just uh, venomous anger in his eyes. And he looks at Elijah, and he probably pointed his bony finger at him and said, You, you're the troublemaker who stopped the rain. And Elijah looks back at him, looks him in the eyes, and says, nah, I didn't stop the rain. You're the troublemaker. You stopped obeying God. You started worshiping Baal. You are the reason the rain stopped. You, Ahab. And in that moment, Elijah comes up with, and he didn't come up with it, God did, but he, he sets up this elaborate illustration with King Ahab. And I want you to look at it with me in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse, verses 20 to 24. Let's start with verse 20. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets, he's talking about the prophets of Baal, on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the Lord and said, or I'm sorry, he went before the people, he went before the people, and this is what he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long are you going to sit on the fence, guys? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if, but if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said what? Nothing. Nothing. We'll come back to that. So Elijah said to them, okay, uh, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. So just imagine he's standing there among all these people, the 450 uh, prophets of Baal standing there in, in some semblance of order, and him. He says, look, I, I'm, I'm the only one here. I'm the only prophet of God here today. You've got 450 prophets of God. Get two bulls for us. And let them, let those prophets of Baal, let them choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of my Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, what you say is good. Now, imagine if you can, in your mind, this scene. Elijah tells King Ahab to meet him on Mount Carmel. Now, what you need to understand about Mount Carmel is that it was famous in those days for being a lush forest. It was a place of beauty. It was famous for its fertility. They would, uh, on Mount Carmel were, were many olive trees. There were many fruit trees. There were uh, springs and cisterns. A lush, uh, a lush forest. It was a beautiful mountain. But there's been a three-year drought. So it's looking very different. If you can imagine going up top of Mount Carmel, it doesn't look like it used to look. The evidence, get this, the evidence of God's judgment is all around you. You can't miss it. There, all of Israel is assembled, and these 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah. And he challenges them with these words. You know, they look around, they see things dying, they see things withering. 
And he challenges them with these words. It's time to make a decision, people. It's time to make a choice. If God's God, then follow Him. And if Baal is God, then follow Him. But quit sitting on the fence. Quit trying to do both. And the response that he got was what? Nothing. They weren't moved by his words. They, they weren't moved in the spirit by, by if they looked around, they saw God's judgment all around them. They weren't moved by that. They had no response. They probably did what people do today when they hear the preacher say something they don't want to hear. They probably put their head down, thought about something else, rationalized it, made excuses. If they had cell phones, they probably would have been texting while Elijah was talking. They didn't want to hear it. So Elijah says, all right, guys, I'll tell you what. Let's make two altars. And we'll prepare the altars, but we won't light them. You get yours ready, I'll get mine ready. And then you call on your Baal, and I'll call on God. And whoever's God lights the fire, that's who God is. I mean, this shouldn't be hard for you guys. It hasn't rained for three years. The wood's got to be good and dry. To the prophets of Baal, they begin doing this. Look at verse 24. I love this part of it. This really shows where they're at, where, where these people are at. Verse 24, uh, they say, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I'm not sure what translation you're looking at, but it's something along those lines. If I could translate it uh, this way, it would be, this ought to be entertaining. That's all it was to them. They weren't challenged by these words. They weren't moved by it. This ought to be an entertaining show. Sounds like a great idea. That's where they're at spiritually. So the prophets of Baal, they get their altar ready. They begin to pray to Baal. They begin to dance and scream, but nothing happens. Look at verse 27. Verse 27, Elijah begins to pick at them. He begins to taunt them. And he says things to them like, Hey, maybe you need to shout louder. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, Baal is, is asleep. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's indisposed. Maybe he's preoccupied or busy. You need to wake him up. And it says there in the text that they began to shout louder and they began to cut themselves. That was one of the pagan traditions that they would do as they worshipped the false god. They would, they would cut themselves to try to, get the, to appease their false god. And they do this all day long and nothing happens. Look at verse 29. No voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Now it's Elijah's turn. You ready for this? Go to verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. So he's trying to get them to engage again with him. They didn't want to listen to him before, so he's trying to re-engage them. So they came to him. And he, watch this, he repaired the altar of the Lord. Why is it in disrepair? Because King Ahab didn't do what he was supposed to do. So Elijah repairs the altar, which was in ruins. He took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, Large enough to hold, probably uh, the translation here is about 13 quarts of seed. And he arranged the wood, he, he cut the bull into pieces, and he laid it on the wood. And then he does something really interesting. He says to them, all right, now what I want you to do is go get four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now we're in a three and a half year drought, so... These people are probably thinking, are you nuts? We, if there was a spring up on the mountain somewhere that they were going to, they need that water to live. And you want to throw it and, and dump it on this altar? Yep. Go get four large jars and dump it on the altar. So that's what they do. And then he says, do it again. And they did it again. And he says, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So much water went down on this altar that it ran down off the altar and it filled the trench. Now imagine dirt that has been dry 
for three and a half years. I imagine the first few drops that went into that trench probably got soaked up in the dirt, yes? So much water on this altar that it, it sits in the trench. There is no way that a trick could be happening here. There's no way that Elijah's going to go up with a big lighter in his pocket and they can't see it and light it. It's not going to happen. He's not going to be able to bang two rocks and, and, and throw a spark they don't see and trick them into thinking God did something. What happened? At the time of the sacrifice, this would have been in the evening time. Remember the Baal the prophets, they worked on it all day. Come evening time, at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and he what? He prayed. Don't lose that. Hold on to that. He prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. What's this moment about? Is this moment about making Elijah famous? Is this moment about Elijah trying to put on some trickery or some show to get the people's attention? This is about God's glory. This is about... Being able to show and demonstrate that God is God. Answer me, verse 37, O Lord. Answer me so that these people will know you. That you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Who is able to convict these people's hearts? Who? The Holy Spirit. It's not Elijah. He already tried. They didn't want to listen. Who is able to turn their hearts back to Him? The Holy Spirit. Not Elijah. He can't do it. Look at verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the soil and also licked up the water in the church. And when the people saw this, they fell prostrate, they fell on their faces, and they cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. What an impressive sight this would have been. But notice the reaction of the people this time. Their reaction is, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. They did not say, Wow, Elijah's a really good speaker. They didn't say, Wow, what a powerful illustration that Elijah just gave for us. There was no doubt that day who consumed that altar with fire. There was no doubt that day who it was that deserved honor and glory and worship. They were not impressed with Elijah. They had seen and experienced the power of God. And that's what I want in my life. That's what I want for this church. I, I want us to be able to look at our lives, to look at our church and, and be able to say, you know what? The only explanation for this is the power of God. That was the only explanation for that fire that burned that altar up. It had to be God. That's what I want for my life. That's what I want for your life. That's what I want for this church. See, those prophets of Baal, they had a loud, passionate worship gathering. They were able to get a crowd together. They were able to entertain the people all day long. But nothing happened. Nothing changed. And then God showed up. And when God showed up, it was obvious that He alone is God. And it's His power is the only explanation for what happened that day. It is the power of the Holy Spirit is the only explanation for the, the dynamic things that we want to see happen in our lives and in this church. Francis Chan, in the book Forgotten God, wrote this question. Has anyone ever been amazed by your peace. Has anyone ever been amazed by your love? Has anyone ever been amazed by your patience? Has, has anyone ever envied your self-control? And I thought about that. I, I, I thought back through different episodes of my life. And I know that when we were in Pittsburgh with faith for those number of years, 
There were lots of moments when the staff that we were interacting with would, would make comments about our peace, or would make comments about our calm spirit. And, and in all that they were observing were two people that were relying on the Holy Spirit to give them what they needed in the time they needed it. That's all they were seeing. But what about those days at Walmart when I've got one thing to buy, literally one thing to buy, and so I scan the aisles and I look down and I find the shortest one and I see, oh, there's just one lady in this line. That can't possibly take that long. <laughs> so I get in that line and this, this lady, for whatever reason, she decides she's going to split her order into two orders and then pay with nickels. Why? I don't understand that. <laughs> that makes no sense. <coughs> what about those days... When I'm visiting someone at the Altoona Hospital, I'm there doing the Lord's work, so sh surely everything should go fine. And I go to leave the parking garage, and for some reason, the person in front of me is trying to pay with the most wrinkly dollar in the world. I don't know where they got it. I don't know how they prayed it, made it that way, but they're trying to put that into the, the slot for 15 minutes. It's not going to work. What about those days? I wonder if people are amazed by my peace and patience on those days. I wonder if people are amazed by my love and grace in moments like that. And you can take your moments, because I know I'm not alone in that. And I'm, I want you to really think through this about how do we get to that place where when we have those moments, that we hold on to joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. How many of you are able to grit your teeth and clench your fists and close your eyes real tight and say, I will be more patient today. <laughs> How many of you can, can do that and say, I will be more loving today. Arr! How many of you can do it? I can't. And if, and if you found the secret to be able to do that, then God bless you. I can't, it doesn't work for me. Where does supernatural joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, love, where does that come from? Who does it come from? The Holy Spirit. Check these verses out on the screen. Write the references down in your notes. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and Peace and joy in who? In the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of who? The Holy Spirit. See, in those moments at the store or in the parking garage, if we want to overflow with things like hope instead of anger, if we want to overflow with things like patience instead of other things that come out, we need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where real, supernatural hope, peace, patience, joy comes from. And if we're being honest, sometimes we look more like the prophets of Baal. Where we're running around in a frenzy trying to fix our own problems. Trying to do it all by myself. What did Elijah do? Go back to the text. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. He asked God for help. And, it, and if you look at Elijah's life over the, uh, the course of it, you'll see that it wasn't just in these moments of crisis like on Mount Carmel. But it was also on days when he felt this tension that you and I feel between self-reliance and an understanding that I need to rely on God. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Go to chapter 19. Let's read some verses together in chapter 19. So this whole episode just ends. And Ahab, King Ahab, goes back to the palace to tell Jezebel what just happened. And Jezebel's not happy. She's not moved by the Spirit at all. 
So the, 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 the fire burns up the altar. The people turn back to God. And then at the end of chapter 18, all the prophets of Baal were killed. Jezebel's not happy. And in verse 2, she sent a messenger to Elijah to say, If by this time tomorrow you're not a dead man, then may the gods deal harshly with me like, like you did with the prophets of Baal. Now this next verse is absolutely fascinating. Elijah was what? He was afraid. So afraid he ran for his life. He, he runs off to Beersheba in Judah. He runs into the next territory. And he had a servant with him. And, and after he went so far with the servant, he even told his servant, Now I want you to wait here. I don't want you to see where I'm going. He goes another day's journey into the wilderness. Verse 4 says that he came to this, this broom tree out in the middle of nowhere and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he laid down on the tree and he fell asleep. Now let's just pause for a moment. Let's use our theological understanding that we've been building about the Holy Spirit. Was Elijah's prayer the best prayer? No. But what do we know about the Holy Spirit when we offer up selfish prayers? What do we know about what the Holy Spirit does? He, he intercedes. He steps in and He prays for us. Elijah's tired of running. He's overwhelmed. And he prays to the Lord something that maybe is selfish. But I want you to see how through the power of the Holy Spirit, interceding on his behalf, what happens next? Does God come down and kick him in the guts? Say, get up, you sissy. Didn't you see what I just did? Get back where you belong. That might sound like some of your dads growing up, but that's not, that's not how God interacts with Elijah. It says here, all at once an angel touched him. So get up, get up and eat. <laughs> he looked around there by his head. There's this cake of bread baked over hot coals. There's this jar of water there. And he ate and he drank and he laid down again. He's still tired. Verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him. Get up, get up and eat. The journey is too much for you. God understands. He understands he's overwhelmed and tired. And he comes alongside to help him and encourage him. So he gets up and he eats and he drank. And he says here in verse 8, he was strengthened by that food and he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. And Horeb is, is the mountain of God. It says that he went into a cave and he spent the night there hoping that he would have some type of experience, some, some type of overwhelming experience with God. It says the word, this is verse 9, the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And again, verse 10, you know, he's, he's having this conversation with God. What do we call having a conversation with God? We have a word for that. What's it called? Prayer. Very good. So he prays. I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And yeah, there's some selfishness happening. Yes, there's some pity partying happening here. And, and some of the things he's saying he knows isn't even true. When he was on his way back to meet Ahab at the beginning of chapter 18, he comes across Obadiah. The prophet Obadiah tells him, hey, uh, Elijah, listen, I, I've got some prophets stored away. I, I've, been, I've been hiding them. I've been keeping them safe and feeding them. He knew that. Elijah knows he's not the only one left. But he's having this moment. He's having this moment of discouragement. Look how the Lord reacts to him. The Lord said, all right, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now here's what happens with us sometimes. We're looking for this big Mount Carmel type experience. And maybe that's what Elijah thought he was going to have on Mount Horeb. 
But look what happens. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. You can imagine what that would have felt like. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a what? A gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and he stood in the mouth of the cave. And God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And they go on to have this conversation with each other. But I want you to see that even though Elijah experienced this, this amazing moment where, where God does something just tremendous, it wasn't long after that amazing experience that he felt emotions of fear. He felt overwhelmed. He felt like he was all alone and that, that he was losing hope. He was tired of running. And what he was experiencing is this tension that we all experience where we're trying to do life by ourselves at the same time understanding that I need to rely on God. And what did he do? He prayed. He prayed. This Jezebel thing was no real moment of crisis. Think about what he had just been through. He walked right up to King Ahab face to face and challenged him. Boldly. He had this ultimate experience where God brought down the fire and did something that only God can do. And then all the prophets of Baal were killed. I'm pretty sure that God can handle Jezebel, yes? He knew that. I think Elijah was just tired. He experienced the same kind of moment that you and I experience when we're tired, when we're worn out, when we feel stressed and overwhelmed. I think Elijah was feeling this tension between trying some way to, to muster up his, his own courage, to muster up his own joy, to muster up and, and stand on his own two feet. That, that tension of self-reliance and knowing that he needs to desperately rely on God. And I think it's in those daily moments that you and I sometimes experience of, of discouragement when we're tired, when we're stressed out. And in those moments, we sit down, we let out a big sigh, and we say, that's it. I'm done. I've had enough. It's not worth the effort. Or, or maybe in those moments, we let out, we let out anger, and we, we lose our, our patience, and we, we let out this, this lash of anger into someone. Or maybe in those moments we, we lose our joy and we throw this pity party for ourselves. And those are the moments when no one is amazed at our peace. No one is amazed at our joy. No one is amazed at our love. No one's saying, wow, look what God is doing in him. Look what God is doing in her. And maybe you're sitting there listening to that and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I'm not Elijah. I'm not any one of those great people in the Bible. I don't think it's as easy as what you're making it sound. Okay. Fair enough. Let's go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Look at verse 17. You tell me, what does verse 17 say about Elijah? How does verse 17 describe the prophet Elijah? He was a man just like who? Let's make it personal. Elijah was a man just like me. Let's say it together. We'll use the word human, okay? Elijah was a human just like me. What did he do? He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. Elijah was a normal human being, just like you, just like me. He just prayed fervently. I know you're not Elijah, so what? You are praying to the same God Elijah prayed to, yes? Yes. See, every day we live with this tension between our value of, of self-reliance and our actual dependence, our actual need for dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's what we have a tendency to do. 
We have a tendency to only rely on the Holy Spirit during those times of crisis, during those Mount Carmel, fire from heaven kind of moments in life. And then we forget to rely on the Holy Spirit to fill us with supernatural peace, joy, patience, loving kindness, and all those things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we wind up doing is we wind up t taking little things, minor things, and they turn out in, in our minds to be bigger things than they actually are because all along we've been taking them, those little things, one at a time, and we put them in our bucket. We put them in our bucket of worry and we carry our bucket of worry around with us. And it fills up and then before you know we've got this big heavy bucket of stuff in it. Individually they're not that big a deal. But we have accumulated them into something that is heavier than it needs to be. And that happens because we are, we are living on the wrong side of this tension between self-reliance and, and reliance on God. I can carry this one on my own, God. I don't need you for that. It's just a little thing in the bucket. I can, care, I can handle this one on my own, God, in the bucket. Look, I'm doing it all by myself. And the bucket gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Until it reaches a crisis point, and then we dump the bucket out. God, I need your help. I can't carry the bucket anymore. Why were you carrying the bucket in the first place? I believe in personal responsibility. Do you believe in personal responsibility? Probably most of us do. But I do not want to live my life saying, I did it all by myself. And what we need to find is this intermingling between the two. Self-reliance and reliance on God. Do we need to be self-reliant? Yes or no? <laughs> God's not going to uh, tie your shoes, Kathy. I know what you're, you're, I'm getting to where you're going. She's ahead of me. God's, God's not going to come down and put food in your mouth for you, right? We have to have some self-reliance. We've got to do some stuff for ourselves. Right? Yeah, maybe, maybe when you're in a nursing home. We need some self-reliance, yes? Okay. Do we need to rely on God, Kathy? Amen. We need to rely on God. So, which is it? The answer to that question is yes. There must be this intermingling of the two, and here's what it looks like. Yes, I will study for the test. But I will rely on God to help me remember what I've studied. Yes, I will work hard at my marriage and invest in it. But I will rely on God to mold me into the husband he's called me to be. Yes, I will work hard so I can pay my bills. But I also will depend on God to give me wisdom to know what I should and should not be spending my money on. Do you see the intermingling between self-reliance and reliance on God as they come together? Yes, we need to get up out of bed and do what you need to do. You do. Don't be lazy. You gotta get up out of bed and do what you need to do, but don't do it on your own. Rely on God to help you do what you need to do. Does that make sense? When you think about what we just talked about, when you think about it in, in, in a church context, in, in a church setting, here's what I don't want to hear. When we leave this place any any Sunday. What I don't want to hear is what you think of me. Don't care. What I don't want to hear is what you thought of the band. Not interested. What we want to hear when we leave this place week after week is the Lord is God. The Lord is God. He did something in my heart today that can only be explained by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is God. That's what we want to hear when we leave this place. I have seen, I've been watching, and I have seen some of you growing in your faith in tremendous ways. I've noticed it. Because the Lord is God. I have been watching as, as there have been some hurting marriages that have been healing because the Lord is God. There's, uh, there's a young man who accepted Christ uh, a month or so ago, and he's going to be baptized in this pool in a few weeks because the Lord is God. 
There's a, an older lady that comes first service. She came to me this week and, and she said, Pastor, I've been afraid to go over to my neighbor and share the gospel with my neighbor. I know that I should. I've been called to do that. And I'm going to do it this week. I've been praying about it and, the, and I know that the Spirit is going to give me the power to say the right thing. And she's doing that because the Lord is God. I've been watching men in discipleship. I've been watching women on Wednesday night pouring their lives into each other. I've been watching God do some amazing things through the people of Lamersville because the Lord is God. Do you believe that to be true? There was something really powerful about that in 1 Kings. When, when the people saw God at work, they didn't applaud Elijah. What did they say? The Lord is God. I think we need to say that together today. Ready? The Lord is God. The Lord is God. You want to live a more powerful life? Get to know the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Father, thanks so much for our time today. All glory and honor goes to you. Lord, I understand where I stand, I can do nothing significant. That my words mean nothing apart from the power of your Spirit. And I understand that apart from the power of your Spirit, every word that falls from my lips falls possibly on deaf ears. But I also understand that through the power of your Spirit, even a subpar sermon can change a life in radical ways. Lord, I understand that we as ordinary people, no different from the prophet Elijah than that we are all human, can do amazing things through the power of the Holy Spirit. And apart from you, all those significant things that really matter cannot be accomplished. And so we come to you, yes, Understand that we have some responsibility to chase after you. We have some responsibility to accomplish the things that need to be accomplished in our lives. But we also come with humble hearts knowing that we desperately need you to help us accomplish them well. We desperately need you to, to take our efforts, as impure as they are, as imperfect as they are, and do something extraordinary with them. And we ask for your help. We come to you with humble hearts, knowing that you are God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll finish with a song. If you'd like to pray over something, I'd be happy to pray over it.
you with this simple and humble prayer. Maybe we're on top of Mount Carmel in a crisis situation. Maybe we're under a broom tree in just the everyday kind of stuff that we deal with. But we come to you with a humble 